basically it was a two leg crossing uh, and the, the SS United States made that crossing faster than anybody. Uh, I, I want to say I don't have the actual crossing time with me here. Um, boy, I forgot to, to note that down, but it was somewhere in the order of, I believe it was three days, 10 hours and 43 minutes, if I remember correctly. Um, the interesting thing is that no cruise liner since then has surpassed the SS United States speed. It says on my bullet there at the bottom, three other ships won the award from 1969 onward, but with a question mark after it, I put um, those th none of those three ships was uh, considered an actual active passenger carrying cruise liner. Uh, although uh, the United States lines at the time, uh, because it was 1969, actually it was later than 69, I think it was like in 80, you know, somewhere 69 was the first of those three. Uh, the United States lines did not uh, contest the award of the blue ribbon to those three ships. Uh, that said, uh, I think most people who know the cruise industry will tell you that the blue ribbon really still resides with the SS United States. Okay, now we're going to start looking at the ship because this is where we start looking at uh, some of the interesting innards and start talking about um, some of the classified interior and capabilities of this ship, which made it the fastest cruise liner on the Atlantic uh, and uh, an incredible strategic uh, tool for the United States military and the United States government. Uh, this is, and here's where we start seeing a lot of my interior photos. Uh, this is just a passageway that takes you into uh, engine room compartments. Uh, this ship, uh, as much as it was glitz and glamour in in the passenger on the passenger decks uh, down below, this was a working piece of machinery. This was basically a factory uh, with multiple engines, uh, all kinds of control rooms and piping everywhere you could see. Uh, I would imagine by today's standards that this was probably a pretty dangerous place to work for the crew. All right, you can see some of the uh, some of the valves that uh, were moving fluids around, gases around, uh, you know, through the ship. Um, you'll see these kinds of images all over the place. These are deep, dark recesses of the ship. Uh, you can see where those there are some pipes along along the right side of the photo that bend toward and underneath those uh those uh valves this is we are down probably 10 11 decks below the top of the ship uh which was 12 decks high from the bottom all the way up to the uh to the bridge deck this is the uh the low pressure turbine uh next to it to the right which you can't see because it's in another compartment uh was a high pressure turbine uh, these this this end this engines these propellers were driven by by turbines uh, to give them extra speed, uh, which helped make this uh, one of the fastest ships on the high seas. Uh, this was uh, considered at the time of its of its uh, uh, runs across the Atlantic the flagship of the United States government. Uh, its speed, as I said, was classified until 1977. Uh, it was it was classified. Well, it was used uh, was to be used in emergency per circumstances as a troop carrier uh, in the event of war in Europe, which would have been World War Three. Uh, it was going to be capable of carrying 15,000 troops uh, across the ocean if needed uh, for war. OK, one of the things that I th that I think was was an interesting thing as part of my research on this is that. Uh, one of the things you don't notice is that most models of this ship uh, portray the ship as having a, f a reasonably shallow draft and a flat bottom, uh, as most cruise ships have. Uh, this cruise ship, though, had a draft of 30 feet from the waterline down uh, while it was being constructed and after it, while it was in service. There, it, it, it was forbidden to take photographs of of the ship from the waterline down. It was forbidden to take photographs of the ship if it was ever in dry dock. Uh, and that was because its lower end uh, below the surface was considered part of its classified design. Uh, the 30-foot um, 
draft helped uh, stabilize the ship and uh, helped it maintain its speed uh, in the high oceans. Uh, and all of that was considered top secret uh, by the Department of Defense uh, as, it, as it operated. The engines, there were four Westinghouse double reduction engines uh, with geared steam turbines uh, in the ship. Uh, this was one of those turbines, uh, which led to each engine leading to one of the four propeller shafts. Uh, those propeller shafts were, were interesting as well. Uh, there were two four-bladed manganese bronze propellers uh, that were located on the outside of the ship and forward of the stern, and two five-bladed manganese bronze propellers located at the stern. So they had two propellers at the end and two propellers on each side, or one propeller on each side forward of those rear propellers, uh, which, which gave it uh, uh, its power and its speed. Uh, that design and how it was configured was all considered top secret until 1977 when it was declassified. All right. More uh, views of the interior engine room. Uh, you'll see all these workings. There's a lot of rust here, uh, which leads one to wonder, is there any chance that this ship could be uh, repurposed, recommissioned? Uh, based on discussions I've had with people uh, familiar with the ship, uh, I don't know if this is all feasible working engine room machinery and piping. Uh, I believe most most people who know what they're talking about will tell you that a lot of that would have to be completely removed and completely rebuilt to to set this ship back to sea again. <clears throat> that said, I'm not a marine architect. I'm a photographer, so I got a nice picture of the machinery. Don't know if it'll work. Probably not, though. A uh, nice picture of one of the control panels in the engine room. Uh, this was your classic analog. There were no computers running anything here. You looked at your dials, looked at your gauges, read your numbers you know, on your gauges up above, and then turned on and off and adjusted uh, engine workings by hand. There's your propellers. That's one of the five-bladed propellers. Uh, that is sitting uh, on the stern uh, at the back of the SS United States, there's another one to the right of it across the ship on the other side. Those That propeller was literally right below it and under the waterline uh, in terms of where it sat uh, design-wise. Uh, but that is one of those four propellers that was considered top secret uh, technology uh, as of the time of its construction in 1950-52 until classified in 77. That's just a view of one of my companions that uh, assisted me when we, when I went up uh, and did the uh, photography work here. Uh, give you a sense for uh, the just the, the 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 height of the decks and 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 getting from the top of you know from one one deck to the next. Uh, he's two decks above me uh, and that's quite a walk up those stairs. Uh, that is only two of 12 decks. This ship goes down all the way down 30, almost 30 feet below the surface in terms of decks. Uh, and more, I think about 100 feet above from the surface up. Now, here's a little bit in terms of design of uh, the plan of those, of those decks. You can see the on the above graphic, uh, just sort of the, the, the layout of the ship. Uh, both from a, a plant planner side view and an above uh, view looking down on the ship. Uh, it was amazing. It's amazing how big this ship is and how long it takes to go from literally the bow all the way to the stern, um, which is actually not easy. You can't do it in one filled walk. You've got to climb up and down stairs to go all the way across the, uh, from front to back. The, uh, the lower uh, schematic you can see is more of a design uh, with colors associated with, I believe that is, let me get that right there. The different classes uh, and their compartments. The yellow, sorry for looking into the screen there. The yellow uh, color was is the uh, is where all of the first class uh, cabins and dining rooms and lounges were located. Uh, tourist class was the, the second class of service, which was located, whoops, more or less in the purple. And then the blue was uh, 
basically the uh, uh, tourist class, I think is what, not tourist class, but uh, third class. You can see there are a lot of a lot a lot of decks here. There are twelve decks that start all the way up at the bridge and work their way all the way down to the bottom compartments, which are uh, working compartments for the crew in terms of engine rooms, etc. There are some that you can see here. Uh, oh, I see. It's cabin class was the third class. Uh, you'll see a photograph in a few minutes of this little uh, in the back of the in the back of the uh, the ship. There's the swimming pool. Um, we went down and uh, actually got all the way down into there and beyond in the ship. Uh, but you can see that is one of the only things in this ship that uh, was common to all three classes and was for passengers. Um, the lighter highlighting where it says engine room below was all crew compartments uh, where passengers were not permitted to, uh, to wander. The ship did have elevators up and down. Um, that obviously were not working. Uh, I believe they were all taken out when we were in there. Um, but you could see the, uh, the the staircases that cascaded up and down, uh, especially the center uh, staircase underneath that second smokestack. Uh, it's quite an amazing place. All right. Now I'm going to talk about return to service, repurpose, or remembering the ship. The question. The question the the, uh, the one of our attendees had a little while ago was, "Am I going to talk about this?" And the answer is yes. This is one of the big questions facing uh, the ship and facing its current owners. Uh, I will say this: I've had discussions in prepar in preparing this presentation uh, with uh, an organization called the SS United States Conservancy. Uh, if you want to look at their web website, it's ssusc.org. Uh, they are an organization, a nonprofit organization that in, I believe in 2008, uh, purchased the SS United States, 2011, I think started, I want to say, managing it and, and took uh, ownership of it. Uh, they are the organization that is attempting to do something with, with the ship in terms of returning it to service, repurposing it, remembering it, building you know a, mon a museum to it, et cetera. Uh, there are a lot of options that have been discussed over time. Uh, it's anybody guess what's gonna happen now, although there is one that has come up that is actually uh, a fairly interesting uh, discussion. Uh, in terms of the, the ship itself, and I'm gonna go through a few photographs as I talk here. Uh, this is the navigation bridge uh, where the captain of the ship managed um, the, uh, the navigation and operation of the ship. The biggest challenge to, to returning the ship to service, if that's what you want to do, is actually having it somewhere long enough where you could do something uh, and rebuild it, never mind the cost of that. Uh, and that challenge is really the challenge that the uh, United States Conservancy faces right now, which is, it costs them about sixty thousand U.S. dollars per month just to maintain the USS or the SS United States at its berth at Pier ninety two in Philadelphia. The uh, the fundraising to to raise sixty thousand dollars a month has to be an incredibly taxing and stressful uh, endeavor. Um, that's literally just to keep it where it is. Now, that seems to be moving along okay at this point, I will say. Um, the Conservancy got a ship, uh, I'm sorry, let me correct myself. In 2011, they, they took ownership of the ship. The various options uh, for repurposing this ship uh, have come and gone uh, and are, I think, all at the same time still alive as options, some more than others. Uh, some more emotional than emotional than others. Uh, the SS United States Conservancy, ideally, I believe, would like to repurpose this ship to put it back to sea. That would happen more in a perfect world. Uh, the estimated cost to repurpose the ship, to rebuild it, to refit it, and to send it back to sea as a classic cruise liner uh, at today's standards uh, has been estimated to to be a uh, approximately $1 billion in effort. Uh, whether or not there is anybody that would like to, to tackle that project and take on the refitting of the ship is anybody's guess. 
uh, I believe Norwegian Cruise Lines for a period of time was looking at that. Uh, decided not to go uh, go further with with the exploration of that idea, um, but that doesn't mean it's a dead idea. Uh, it has resurfaced at times. Um, doesn't seem to be the most feasible uh, uh, effort at this time. Doesn't mean it won't happen, but doesn't seem to be the most feasible. Uh, in 2015, when I first saw the ship, uh, the idea of scrapping the ship became another option. Uh, which I believe would bring in a fair amount of of funding, uh, but really gets gets to doing gets to the heart of of the SS United States Service is all about, which is preserving the history of the ship to preserve the ship itself as uh, if at all possible. So scrapping it is really not an option. Uh, that I believe when I first became uh, uh, introduced to the ship was a possible option um, because there was a lot of trouble trying to make up the uh, the monthly fees to uh, to pay for the birthing of the ship in Philadelphia uh, and scrapping it for for steel and its aluminum um, was was financially viable, emotionally not at all viable. Uh, but that was one thing that was one of the options. The other option at that time that uh, that I came into contact with with uh, the ship for was the idea of creating an artificial reef in Florida off the coast of Florida with the SS United States. Uh, I was asked by a third party, Artificial Reefs International is the company, uh, to come in uh, and look at doing uh, 360 degree uh, photography, virtual reality, uh, and an underwater virtual reality of this ship as a dive attraction, as a dive, a scuba diving training facility, uh, and an artificial reef all in one uh, as a another possible uh, option for the disposal of the ship. Um, this was obviously a secondary um, secondary objective or possible option for the conservancy uh, but it was a financially eh, believed to be by some to be a financially viable option uh, as the cost for for i guess decommissioning the ship, cleaning the ship uh, so that it could be sunk safely and environmentally safely uh, was between 20 and 25 million dollars, as I recall, at the time in 2015. The economic return on the ship, uh, which would have come to the state of Florida and any other uh, 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 tourist entities in, in Florida that would benefit, it, was estimated to be somewhere between 900 million and a billion dollars over several decades of time. So it would have made up a lot of money and, and uh, for uh, the economy of Florida. Uh, would have meant a lot to the dive industry. Would have meant a lot to to the tourist industry in Florida. Uh, would have preserved the ship as an artificial reef uh, in terms of uh, it being alive and and environmentally providing shelter for fish uh, and and marine life, which uh, artificial reefs have been shown to do. Uh, but again, to go back to the emotional aspects of refitting the ship, it does not re does not get to the heart of restoring, preserving the history of the SS United States as the flagship of the United States. So those options have, I would like, uh, I think it's fair to say, have kind of uh, gone to the back burner. Uh, there is an option that did. Uh, uh, did surface uh, earlier uh, in 2018, I believe the idea uh, was being explored to to look at uh, turning the SS United States into a waterside commercial uh, uh, development of some sort, much like the Queen Mary, I believe it is in Long Beach, California, uh, basically refitting some or all of the passenger compartments of the ship with office suites, with uh, with shops, with hotel, with a hotel or hotels, uh, possibly with multiple restaurants, uh, to make this basically a waterside, all-purpose 
you know, shopping center, mall, uh, museum, visitor center, uh, office complex. Uh, that effort is still ongoing right now. And my understanding is, is that um, there is a firm that has decided uh, that has studied this and decides that it is feasible to do. And right now what we're looking at, uh, what they're looking at is trying to encourage one of the major United States coastal cities, uh, waterfront cities, uh, to uh, to look at uh, uh, adopting the SS United States, birthing her in, in, in their city and building that waterfront commercial complex uh, uh, growing out of the United States into uh into that facility uh that uh and that's as of june of this year uh is the latest news that i've seen that this is moving forward and that they're trying to attract one of those cities uh the the challenge we have right now is obviously the world is in a big pandemic and everybody's locked down or semi-locked down and uh probably a little bit less inclined uh to to venture out financially to the extent needed to to make this happen. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's not an option that won't take shape uh, as the next few years uh, uh, come. Anyway, the last two photographs you've seen, this one included uh, or passes were uh, our uh, photos of the one of the uh, one of the passenger uh, promenade decks uh, that the passengers would would recreate in uh, and do some lo- long walks as they were uh, traveling across the Atlantic. Uh, this was included with part of the sport, the sport sun and sport deck. Uh, you can see all the way back from here, all the way back to the to the uh, to the stern, the two uh, smokestacks. Uh, there were there were uh, shuffleboard uh, courts uh, painted on on the uh, on the um, on the uh, decks uh, so that the passengers could recreate as they went. Uh, this gives you a sense for how enormous this ship is. That is the swimming pool, which I believe, as I said, was down in in deck ten, uh, two decks from the, from the very bottom of the ship. Uh, I'm not sure that would have been the most most enjoyable uh, swim that that anybody's ever had. Uh, I like swimming in pools outside with with nice open air above me. You don't have that with the SS United States. Uh, but this was an operating working pool. I believe the depth of that pool at the far end uh, was was ten feet, might have been twelve, uh, and it was a little shallower up up uh, at the front end here in the photograph. Um, that is definitely deep, dark, and down in the in the bowels of the ship. Um, we all had hel- helmets with. Uh, I believe we had lights on there. I had a. A couple handfuls of uh, of small portable uh, lights, dive lights, photo- photographic lights that we had to turn on just to be able to see this because it was basically pitch black in there. This is a nice little uh, picture I like from the, uh, looking from the bow backwards toward the bridge. Uh, there you see Save the United States.org. That's the SSUSC.org, which is the Conservancy's uh, website. Uh, uh, there are a bunch of uh, posters uh, down below on the deck, uh, or banners of uh, of uh, donors and and uh, people that have volunteered and organizations that have helped the conservancy. Gives you a sense again for how enormous this ship is. Uh, this is the one of the uh, lower decks at the stern of the ship, uh, which was uh, um, for rope stowage. Uh, there are cap stands all throughout there to uh, to connect ropes. Those a lot of those ropes uh, that which they had in, the, in a deck on in the in the bow end of the ship as well were there to tie the ship off as it was uh, moored in port wherever it happened to be. Uh, so this is sort of one of the working end um, images of of the ship that the passengers would never have seen when they when they were traveling in their uh, luxury. This little photo I like was uh, on a small little shelf in one of the comp- in one of the passageways that we passed through. Another thing that was just sort of ignored while you were traveling around in luxury on the SS United States, there were you know means for you to deal with emergencies 
These were emergency rations uh, and drinking water uh, approved by the United States Coast Guard uh, for use on the ship. Um, they have not been opened. I presume that there's still water and something that might look like food on the inside of that square can. Um, but those were the emergency rations you would have inside your uh, your lifeboats if you were ever uh, lowered down to the to the water and had to survive. Uh, so there were there are interesting things about all this. Uh, this is a, an image uh, of a passageway with uh, down low. Uh, when we came into the ship, uh, gives you a sense for what the status of the ship is right now. Uh, as I said, the SS United States has been sitting at birth in Philadelphia since, I believe, 1994. Uh, since 69, when it was, when it was uh, taken out of service, this ship has seen very little action, uh, very little activity, uh, almost no, you know, I think almost no passenger use whatsoever. Uh, this ship's been sitting for 26 years in Philadelphia, and fighters have taken it over. The cobwebs are everywhere. Uh, it's really kind of sad to see it sitting there. Uh, that said, everybody uh, that has looked at it says it's structurally sound, so it can be repurposed. Uh, the point here is it's got to really be, uh, uh, it's got to be really be some big expenditure to make this, uh, make this happen. Another image of uh, some of those cobwebs and some of the light peering through in those in those uh, portholes. Uh, really interesting. This is when you get into the ship at this point and you realize that it's not been a working ship for 51 years. Uh, you see almost every bit of the interior that's been been dragged out of it, uh, been ripped out, been cleaned out of it. Uh, you realize that uh, these ships are basically gigantic hulls. They're, they're just frameworks, frameworks within which you can put humanity. Uh, it, it's interesting. It is scary. It, it looks like if you're if you've ever heard of the concept of urban exploration or urbex, this is this is an urban explorer explorer's uh, dream is to go through this ship and see the past, see the history that was here. Uh, and also see the fact that it's sitting here unused for decades. Uh, and it is kind of sad uh, from an emotional perspective uh, to think that this ship was a top secret classified piece of, of technology uh, that was also at exact at the same time the fastest cruise liner, one of the most glamorous and, and, and glitzy group cruise liners uh, that cruised the Atlantic Ocean uh, with celebrity uh, passengers all the time. Um, this ship had a life of its own, had, had, has a history, um, uh, and that is all sitting, waiting for something to happen now at birth in Philadelphia. Last image I'll leave you with is this image of the SS United States that I took from, for obviously from the pier, uh, looking back from the bow back. Um, this is my favorite image of the ship. Uh, gives you, uh, I think, uh, a perspective on the size of it looking up and looking down. Uh, you get a sense for uh, the wear and tear that this ship has been through uh, in all of its years at sea and sitting at berth inactive. Um, you can see the peeling paint and the rust. Um, it is still there. The SS United States is still uh a viable, a viable ship in terms of its structure, uh, and it's waiting for something to happen. It's waiting for somebody to do something with it, uh, and uh, I hope that uh, that somebody that the that the USS Conservancy uh, can can make something happen with this. Uh, at this point, uh, that concludes my remarks, and I'd be more than happy to take any questions that anybody has. Um, this has been rather marvelous, Frank, because it, almost everybody who is tuned in right now has some sort of relationship with this ship. And uh, unfortunately, some of them don't have a microphone on their computer, so they can't share some of their memories. But there are a few who are very anxious to speak. So let me start with Arthur, and he's hoping his microphone's going to work. And um, okay. Frank, if you would just mute yourself while people are speaking, and that will make the sound um you know, the ultimate. 
Oh, thank you. Arthur, are you with us? Yes, I am. Do you hear me? We hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Frank, first of all, I want to pay you a compliment, and I have the proof. I spent earlier this year doing a complete search of all the records I could find online and thousands of photographs. And the photographs you showed today are in a class beyond any of the others. And the reason I can say that, had I seen these, I would have contacted you months ago. Anyway, to the point, I am, I'm calling you, by the way, from the building that was the very first Gibbs Brother office, which was in 11 Broadway, before they moved on to 1 Broadway and then on to West Street. Um, let's make today, let's make today the start of part of the history of the United States. You mentioned all the possible uses for the United States. First of all, the current proposal is DOA. It was DOA before COVID-19. It's completely dead now. No municipality is going to put money into creating new host hotel and conference space when they're all going to be worried for the next 10 years about simply filling all the space major cities like New York and every other city has. I believe sincerely that the single most imaginative, the single most ambitious proposal possible is the one that can concede. While no one may be thinking about it actively, we need a powerful defining symbol in 2026, July 20, 2026, for the biggest celebration in American history, which is the 250th anniversary of the United States. I sincerely believe it can happen and should happen that on the morning of July 4th, 2026, the United States, under its own power, sails into New York Harbor and becomes the symbol of, of America's past, present, and future. Not as a cruise ship, but as a ship that basically travels the world and spends time in ports over the world representing the best that the United States represents. It's past, it's pre, it's past in terms of the United States in presence, in our ability to basically restore it to its original glory and basically sailing into the future. Yes, it's a $1 billion project for sure, but I think if particularly you, Frank, would seem like have a lot of connections, if you're willing to embrace it, not necessarily on this phone call, embrace it, we can start and we can create a national interest because I think there's so much logic to it and we're running out of time to begin that, of course, it's only talking about five years away, that this ship can be fully restored to, to its glory and its speeds in when it was originally had its an inaugural voyage in New York Harbor in 1952. We need such a symbol. I don't think there's anything that compares. I was responsible for bringing the great charging bull here to Bowling Green back in 1989. And I spoke to that great artist about for a while about creating, we need a new sculpture that represents the 250th anniversary. Just as, although the Statue of Liberty wasn't completed till after the 100th anniversary, it was meant to be the symbol for the 100th anniversary. I don't believe that any work of sculpture could possibly compete with restoring the United States, create the kind of excitement and national identity as fully restoring the United States. I think it's a unique opportunity in American history, and I hope we can discuss it further and that you will show some interest in doing so. If you have any reaction now, I'd love to have it. Well, the first reaction would be, I would love that too. Uh, and anything you would want from me in terms of photographing the ship uh, to to help support that effort, I'd be more than happy to do that. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a billion dollars in my pocket to help, but I will contribute how I can. <laughs> uh, the reaction I had as you were speaking is was that it was kind of interesting. I was brought into this project as I said, by a third party that was a company expert in sinking ships as artificial reefs. I've dived on some of those reefs that the, that company sank. Um, I was brought in to do underwater photography uh, work on this, uh, should it happen. And essentially, I went in basically doing uh, a reconnaissance trip just to get a sense for what this was all about. And 
And I will tell you that even though from a diver's perspective, that would have been really uh, interesting to me, uh, the history, yes, is just too dramatic and too monumental to to allow to disappear ben beneath the waves. Uh, I think it should be done too, I agree with you. Frank, are you available at FFS Photography? Is that your company? FFS, yeah. Photo yes, okay. that's me. Right. You can uh, Frank at FSSPhotography.com. Right. Right. Uh, I'll is my email I also did four, I've done four videos myself, which I will send you the links to, but uh, thank you for what you did today. And I, and until proven otherwise, I think it can happen. It's, it's, it's incredibly ambitious, but the, the billion dollar cost is not the showstopper here, which the showstopper is generating enough interest. In fact, the official yes. 250th anniversary committee does not have, but should have a centerpiece project. And if they can be reached, if they can be convinced, there's no doubt that the billion dollars can be raised. And on the morning of July 4th, this glorious ship looking exactly as it did in 1952, sailing into New York Harbor would be one of the great moments in American history. It would be, it definitely would be. Thank you. Thank you for that Thank lovely you. vision and, and thought, Arthur. That, that would be quite something. Thank you. Okay, and now I am going to, um, hold on one second. Richard, would you like to speak? I know you had a couple of thoughts and questions. So can you hear me, Frank? Yes. Can hear you. Okay, so just a little bit of history. Um, I was raised in Long Island, New York City area, and I remember the United States. Um, my dad was enamored with the United States. He actually built a Ravel model of the United States, and it was a uh, showcase piece that he had on a mantle, and he actually drilled out some of the portholes and put a light bulb in the hull, such that it, like it would be sailing at night. I mean, it, he loved the thing. Um, I mean, it was an interesting time. You know, cruise ships today are built for holding people. This was built for speed. I remember the competitions between mm -hmm. the United States and their, uh, the France, which became the Norwegian Cruise Line um, ship, the Norm. And, and things of that nature. So I know my dad passed away in 1999, but he was always very disheartened when he ever saw the condition of the United States when it was sitting in Philadelphia. I thought I remember a prince in Saudi Arabia that at one point was interested in purchasing it and either trying to refurbish it for um, cruising or for a hotel. I'm an, uh, interested in the whole, I'm a scuba diver myself and therefore even interested in, you know, the, scuba side of it uh, diving wrecks is of interest in mine um but yeah it was it, i really look forward to this talk this was when i was out cutting my grass and stopped to actually come in and, and and listen to your talk so thank you very much for taking the time and and um providing the, the information well thank you for your uh, comments as well richard uh it really is something else this ship and uh you just if you haven't been written person uh you should try to get the opportunity to do that i think the uh, conservancy does tours occasionally they're kind of on hold right now because of the pandemic but it's just incredible to 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 take in its enormity so yeah nice comments thank you okay john would you like to ask your questions Oops. Okay. I was just kind of interested in uh, knowing whether there were tours of the uh, the ship. And as you just pointed out, there are. Um, I, I will tell you that. I did uh, want to know if there were records related to passengers uh, on the ship. I cannot point you towards them myself right now off the top of my head. Uh, but I have seen that there are pa some passenger records available. I think there are probably a lot of them. Uh, you know, the, the, the celeb just to give you an example, the celebrity photos that I showed you uh, back in the middle of the presentation uh, was really a small, a small uh, part of the overall list that I found that was just sort of, hey, these people traveled on the SS United States. Uh, and those celebrities were, that was like 30 some odd folks. And I think there were a lot more that traveled it that weren't even on that list. Okay, but so where did you find? I think there are records out there. 
Okay. Yeah. And then you said that the fastest crossing time was three days, 10 hours, and 40 some yeah. minutes? 40, yeah, 40 some odd minutes. I may have gotten that wrong. Uh, well, that sounds about I right. I write it down when I was preparing my presentation. I apologize. But if you give me literally a, a couple of moments, I'm getting on Wikipedia on my phone right now, and I'll be able to tell you. <laughs> okay. And do you know when that was? I believe it was on its maiden voyage, which was 1952. July 3rd, 1952 was when it left. I think it left Portsmouth, UK, or Southampton or Portsmouth. Uh, uh, where's the crossing speed? Okay, so that was from Southampton uh, or to Southampton. Uh, yeah, but the the wreck of the the, the blue ribbon is is for both crossings so it's an average speed of two and had to have passengers on board as well hmm okay i, I i'll tell I, you what i i don't want i don't want to like sit here and look at my phone for half an hour and not find it for you it's there fine. somewhere on wikipedia ss united states uh and you can find the records uh for the exact uh number i apologize that for whatever reason that just sort of went right out of out of my uh mind um uh, but it's uh it's definitely uh, a fast speed and nobody had had uh equaled that until i think it was the 1969 effort that was a small i think it was a, a carrying transatlantic ferry from britain that that broke the i think it was one way record so Okay, anyway, well, that was, that that was written. I, I was looking uh, what the speed was from La Havre to New York. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that speed, to be honest okay. with you. All right. Yeah, sorry. I, I appreciate your uh, information. Welcome. Okay, we have another comment from Chung, and let me just unmute. Okay, Chung, you're on. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Frank, for the extremely informative presentation. I'm a, I, in my spare time. I'm a docent at the Marshall George C. Marshall um, House Museum in Leesburg. So I'm very interested in Cold War history. And I, uh, at the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned this ship was built uh, for Cold War uh, to transport soldiers. Do you have any additional background information about why this ship was commissioned uh, and uh, how long it took to build a ship of this size? Thank you. Uh I'll see if I can go backwards there. How long it took was easy because the construction started in 1950, ended in 1952, and it was approximately two years long in terms of construction. Uh, so it, it took a while. Uh, although for a ship that size, I'm not sure that was all that long. So it was about two years. Uh, not a whole lot of information available about uh, the envisioned Cold War use for the ship. Uh, if you look, uh, what I would suggest is looking at the United States Maritime Administration's website. Uh, that is the organization. I, I kind of mentioned some of its, its pre, pre, uh, predecessor organizations, but uh, because the Maritime Commission was the, the organization that actually commissioned the SS United States uh, that organization was preceded by the United States Shipping Board. All the shipping board, the commission, and the maritime administration all oversee, and the administration still oversees uh, merchant marine uh, and maritime affairs in the United States. Uh, the maritime administration website has a, a nice history uh, 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 section on its website, which will give you a lot of insight into uh, what they do in terms of national security. Uh, the SS United States was one of many efforts um the maritime commission which operated mostly during world war ii was involved in the victory ship and the liberty ship programs uh follow on to those were i believe beginning of world war ii was the uh the ss america 
uh, as a flagship. The United States followed in after World War II in the 50s. Uh, there were other programs as well. Um, there was the nuclear ship Savannah, which I think was built in 1959, operated until about 1970, was the first and only nuclear powered uh, oceanic cargo ship that was ever built. Uh, which is sitting in Baltimore now and is toured a couple of times a year. Um, there are an entire range of, of those things that are that are highlighted on that website uh, in terms of history. Uh, and I've researched all that and, and, and gone beyond their website to find information on a lot of these different programs. Uh, as far as the United States goes in Cold War, there isn't a whole lot, as I said, about it being used as a troop carrying ship because it never was used as a troop carrier. Uh, it was literally an emergency plan just in case, and they put a heck of a lot of effort into it. Uh, and as I said, the plans, the engine designs, the propeller designs, the design of the hull, um, the below the surface, below the water hull uh, portion of the hull uh, was all classified until 1977. Uh, that was really all because I think the Department of Defense didn't want uh, the Soviet bloc and the communist world to find out how we built the fastest ship in the world and how it was going to get troops everywhere we needed. So, Thank you very much. I'll definitely look it up. It's an intriguing tidbit, but not a whole lot of detail because nothing was ever done with it. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. informative. Kathy, you had a lot of interesting memories about traveling on the ship. I think you said you took six voyages on it. Uh, would you like to share some of those? I can unmute you and just, uh, let's see. Um, Kathy? Okay, you were actually incorrect about six voyages, six voyages on different ships. Oh, um, sorry. One, the first voyage was on this ship. I would have been three years old. Um, our family... Um, uh, was on the ship at the time when the uh, movie Bon Voyage was filmed, and we actually appeared uh, very, very, very briefly behind the um, lead characters, Fred McMurray and Dane Wyman, in that. Um, now, your presenter, um, I missed most of this. I had trouble getting in, but um, unfortunately, I'm ho I hope there'll be an opportunity to see some more of the pictures. But I did come in when your presenter was talking about the pool and saying, very negative things about the pool. And I must say that the pool is my fondest memory. I possibly conflate several of the different ships. We were also on the SS America. We were on the SS France. But the, um, but the pool was a marvelous experience for a child. Um, the way I, I remember very much that room, um, the, exactly the way the room was laid out and uh, the way the pool would shift. I guess this is nothing new for anyone who's been on a cruise. But because, of course, the water stayed level when the ship tilted, you had the sense that you were everyone would swim uphill and then swim downhill. And this was very, very exciting for a child. So um, don't derogate the pool. Um, I wish I'd been able to see more pictures. Um, I remember how tall the, the ship was. They would give you balloons, and you would drop the balloons off, and it would just seem like they fell down forever into the wake of the ship. So, uh, and then I remember the gala dinner uh, at the end um, which would um, and and throwing streamers and things like that. That's pretty much all I have to say. But I, I just uh, um, it, it's very cool to see some. I wish I could see the rest of your pictures. I hope there's another opportunity, perhaps, for that. Uh, I believe. Thank you for your comments, Kathy. The uh, I believe the the presentation is going to be re has been recorded, Lorraine. Correct. Uh, I think she only recorded part. Um, it, there was a little problem in the beginning of it, but most of it will be recorded. So okay. yes, Wonderful. I'll, I'll we might have missed one or two pictures in the beginning. Wonderful. Thanks uh, for doing this. You I, send, I look you forward send to your email, the send your email address to Lorraine. Uh, we'll see what we can do. Thanks so much. And yeah, I'm sorry about my comments about the pool as well. Uh, my <laughs> own experience was going down into the deepest, dark black bowel of the ship and uh finding the pool all the way at the back and uh I think this well, wasn't if I'm still on i can tell you that yeah. in a i think it was a later trip when we had seen a flipper episode where someone had gotten stung by a jellyfish and we spent one whole trip where i was terrified to go in the pool at all because i thought jellyfish might be able to come in through the filter and i spent <laughs> the entire time my parents thought i would use up all of the water, all of the fresh water on the ship, just staying, spending all my time in the showers. 
So that's a little <laughs> bit more personal story, but. <laughs> well, we're glad the jellyfish didn't get you on that ship. Trip. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so Kids much. have interesting experiences on ship. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's someone else who traveled quite a bit on the, uh, the ship and has a lot of memories. And she said that one night, um, it was the captain's dinner and it coincided with her sister's sixth birthday. And she thought all the fuss was about her birthday and the, the crew just went along with it. So I thought that was a really nice uh, little comment. That is but, nice uh, Yeah, there are some people who just don't have a microphone and can't share their comments, unfortunately. But thank you so much, Frank. This was just uh, just so interesting. And you've done a series of these programs on these relics and, you know, parts of history that people may have forgotten. And it, it's just marvelous to bring that you're doing this, that you're reminding people of these great parts of our past history. So thank you very much. And thank you all for attending. I'm going to type my email address right here. If you would like to reach Frank or if you have any comments about the program, please don't hesitate to contact me. Frank, would you like to share your email address as well? Uh, yeah, can I type that in or should I just uh, uh, Or just tell me and I'll type it right now. Okay. Frank at fssphotography.com. All right. Thank you all yeah. so much. And we will put Thank the recording everybody. on the event calendar on our website as soon as it's ready in a day or two. Bye bye now. Okay, Frank, and if you'll just hold on one second. Yep. I meant to ask you actually to go over a little bit the difference between the SS and the USS. You know, I, I did get one question about that that I thought was interesting. Uh, yeah, I'm, I know the presentation is over, but the SS uh, traditionally has meant steamship. Yeah. Oh, because so someone told I looked it up and it said sailing ship on Wikipedia. It could be ship. It could be in, in in the modern era, it's steamship because there are no not as many sailing ships as well. Um, oh, okay. So yeah, you've got a whole series of, of abbreviations. USS, I think means United States ship, which generally speaking means a US military vessel. Um, you have others was uh, you have F, F slash V, it's fishing vessel, R slash V is a research vessel. Um, a variety of those kinds of designations for the front of, of all kinds of ships and boats. Yeah, um, that's cool. But they, you know, there's a lot of people who just take that for granted. They've heard forever SS or USS, yeah. but all of a sudden they yeah. sit down and say, hey, why? why do they get those designations? <laughs> yeah, all those ships I talked about at Mallows Bay were all SSs. They were all steamships, but they literally were running on steam. They had steam engines that were running their motors. Although so actually, do the yes, United States have steam as well? as well yeah. as the um, yes uh the, i mean they had fuel that they used that they burned to to run the steam turbines yeah which then okay. turned the propeller all right okay i'm going to end the program hold on just a okay. second thanks again to everyone for joining